Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, September 17th. How'd that happen? Wow. <laughs> Time is flying by, huh? 2020, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know there's other things you can be doing other than be here, and I appreciate your coming here tonight. Thank you so much. So what are we going to talk about? Well, current market conditions, obviously. I'm going to have a lot more to say about that. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, if they're not related to the slides, just hold off on them. Some ADD doesn't kick in. And then when we get to the live charts, you can ask about anything you want. We can always come back to the slides, too. Same thing goes for your favorite stock picks. Just wait until we get to the actual charts before you ask about stocks. And just ask about stocks one ticker at a time. If you don't mind, that's for your benefit to make sure I don't pass over any of them or not see some of, some of them. So we talk about, well, I think tonight would be a good night to talk about how the methodology actually works, show the methodology in action. That's something that's been kind of a reoccurring theme over my other show over at stockcharts.com because people are a little bit newer to the methodology. But the more I think about it, the more important it is. And in showing these setups that have triggered, in some cases, hit additional profit targets, and I've showed enough losses in the past to know for you to know that obviously we do occasionally lose money doing all this. But I think in going through these examples of recent trades that were in the Landry list, and uh, or more specifically in a trading service, and then possibly coming out of the Facebook group, I think it's a really good lesson because a lot of things sort of get fleshed out in the process, such as applying a little discretion on a near miss or a fast move on the open and opening gap reversal, things like that. And that'll make a lot of sense as we get to it. And in going through these walkthroughs, a little psychology comes out and, and, and psychology is really obviously the most important thing about trading. And I've reached a point where that is something that I spend probably the most amount of time studying my own and then learning from you guys. And then uh, the main thing I do is I read a lot of these old, old, old Wall Street books, ideally 50 to 100 years old and sometimes even more. And that'll all come out as we go through this. This is claim screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. I was all this summing up, borrowing a line from my buddy, Greg Morris. All predictions about the future. A lot of stuff can happen to me now and then. So as you guys know, we everybody here is, is I think, in the Facebook group. And if you're a gold member, DaveLandry.com, you need to join the Facebook group. If you're not a gold member, you have to be a gold member. And I'll explain that in just a few minutes. But the great thing about the group is we got a lot of good guys, and John's here tonight because he didn't like what his wife was watching on TV. <laughs> and uh, John was asking about AFib and BEKE. I think I'm long AFib or was long AFib. Uh, I have to check. That's embarrassing that I don't remember. I think I'm I'm still long that one. Uh, yeah, it must be. Look, I'm long AFib in this Facebook post. So this is a Facebook post. I just grabbed this straight out of Facebook to see if we were talking about it ahead of time. Yes. Ideally, I don't want to show you something in hindsight, or I also don't want to go out and cherry pick something that I didn't already trade myself. Not that I'll never show you a setup that I didn't take, but ideally, and I think over the last year or so, I don't think I've showed you anything that I, hasn't, that I haven't mentioned ahead of time or we haven't discussed in the Facebook group. By mentioning ahead of time, it means that it's in the Landry list, which is published daily in my trading service or it's in the actual service as an actual recommendation. So I just want to show you this post here to show you that we were talking about this stock. And I see a couple of you guys and girls also took the trade. Now we had a really nice trend and then we had a pullback in that trend. And I nearly missed the setup. I was doing my buy it B analysis. Now buy it B, this is a little bit higher price stock. So there's a few caveats that apply, and that's why I didn't take the initial push higher in this stock because for the buy at B pattern, you're looking to buy the five-day closing high with quite a few caveats. We've been through this quite a bit in the past, so go in and watch prior shows on that. If you're a member, a gold member of DaveLandry.com, go in and watch the stuff we've done in IPOs 
And obviously in the IPO course, we go into even more detail on that. But in this case, it was a higher price, much, much higher price IPO. So I figured I'd wait for the first pullback. And I was going through my IPOs, looking for new closing highs to see if I had to, anything that needed to be bought on the close back on September 10th. And I'm like, holy moly, this is one that I was supposed to take on a pullback. And it's like, well, you know, it's rallying up now. It looks like it's it would have triggered anyway. So I'm just going to take it. So I took the trade near the close. And there's the actual trade. And what I like to do is kind of show a trade on like a representative account, like a model account, just enough to show you that I'm actually taking it. <laughs> this kind of reminds me years ago, uh, God rest his soul, my dad, it's like a, I'd asked him to get a credit card for something uh, that I was doing as a kid. And uh, he put $30,000 as his income on the credit card. Not that he was a wealthy man or anything, but I knew he made a little bit more than $30,000. And he's like, yeah, you just got to put enough. You don't want to put too much. Just let them know that you're, uh, <laughs> you're, you have enough to uh, make it work. So what I like to do is I have one account. I consider my bottle account. And I pull trades out of this. So if you were trading, the point I'm trying to get to here is a representative account would be, let's say, 100K in this particular case, right about that level. And with a 10 point stop, as I'll show you in one second, you would only take 200 shares. So stop would be down here, 10 points away from the entry. Initial profit target up here, right about 60. And let's see what happened. So you can see the stock rallies up and hits the initial profit target. Now I actually got out a little bit less than that. And I'll show you why in just one second. I was trying to squeeze out some additional profit. So what's kind of cool is through teaching, I feel like, okay, well, let me do something that's really cool here. And if it works out, it's gonna be a, a really great lesson. And if it doesn't work out, I, I could show it as well. Does it always work out? And I was hoping, I know, hope. I'm not going to make the gross joke, but I was hoping like some of these stocks we've seen lately that this thing might have had another 10 or 20 point run in it on September, what was that, the 16th. So what I done, what I did, and you can see there's the actual selling of 100, and I'm still long the stock, by the way, and I'll show you that in just one second. So I ended up selling 100 at 58.8, and I think I was looking for like 59 nine or something like that so about a point below where i intended to take partial profits but the real money is in the second loaf of the trade anyway if you could establish a free position or should say if you could establish enough free positions then eventually you'll own the world if, if you don't have too many losers in between and that's my whole goal with trading my methodology this trend trading thing is to get in get that swing trade piece off and then trail that stop higher at least get it to break even, as you'll see in a few of these examples tonight. And then hopefully, I don't know this word hope, there's that word hope, but hopefully gradually loosen up that stop over time to adjust to the longer term volatility and ride out a longer term trend. Now, I don't want to start from square one with the money management because I think everybody here knows the money management and has the module if they need it. But the bottom line is, if you were to try to trade just for longer term trends, you would only be right about 28% of the time. But when you're trading for these swing trades, you're gonna be right, hopefully a little bit more or a lot more than 50% of the time. Now, that's the thing that's a little odd for people. I thought you're a professional, you're not, you're not right more than 50% of the time, not really. You know, not, not much more than that. Now, you see these things out there like, oh, 90% correct or 99% correct. But what they don't tell you is that those type of systems to phrase the old commodity adage, eat like a bird and, and, and poo like an elephant. So if you're doing longer term trend following, just to kind of circle back to that, you're only going to be right about 28% of the time. So 72% of the time, round numbers, you're going to be wrong on your longer term trades. You're not gonna capture that many longer term trends. And that's why people like the turtles did really, really great, not to take anything away from them. I don't know if any of them still exist or, or what's going on with those guys, but they were, they were in a pretty good place at a pretty good time. And if you're just doing pure longer term 
trend following, especially if it's breakout related, like the turtles was, you'll do really, really well if the market is breaking out and following through. It's kind of like the Darvis thing we talked about several weeks back. And we'll come back to him, by the way. But the bottom line is you're going to have horrible drawdowns. And that's why a lot of those turtles are no longer trading or running money and, and doing all those other great things because the drawdowns are really abysmal and your accuracy is horrible. But if you can wrap your head around all that and live with it, then you can do this longer term trading. Now, somebody in the group pointed out, which is kind of cool. Anybody here tonight remember this? Uh, one of you guys in Facebook uh, po put out a post that Dennis actually realized that the turtles were risking too much, and he put out a post or something on that. But if you guys can remember that or find it in a group and put it in the chat, I'll check it out and I'll read it tonight. Anyway, long story endless, and I didn't mean to go off on this tangent, but it's probably good that I did. Because the longer term trading can be abysmal in the drawdowns and abysmal in the accuracy, but that's where the real money is we're left with a dilemma of, okay, well, pure short-term trading doesn't make enough. And I know a lot of people make a little, make a little, make a little, make a little, and then they get crushed. And then they got to start over again. And they call those anthill type of strategies. And so I forget who it was. I think it was Eckerd, William Eckerd said that the success rate is probably one of the least important statistics. And he went on to say, paraphrasing that, what feels good over the short term isn't what works in the longer term. So my hybrid approach to, hey, let's get in, try to capture that little swing trade gain. And there's some psychological things that actually work in with that too. Not to get all fresh from psychology on you, but it has a little bit of that Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And down at the bottom of the list, I think it's Wi-Fi, and then above that is food and air and water and <laughs> et cetera. But as you climb those needs, it's like you do have this need to to be right, and then you also have the self actualization. Easy for me to say higher up the ladder, and that's where the capturing those longer term trends comes into play and growing your account over the long term, surviving on the short term with the short term trading and hopefully keeping your head above water, maybe a little bit more, not too bad at drawdowns, and then bam, hitting out of the park every now and then on the longer term trades. So I digress quite a bit on that, but the point is that through this hybrid approach, we're looking to take the swing trade profits half and then hang on for the remainder. And then this is something I was gonna discuss later in the show, but I'll touch upon it now since I'm off on this rant, is when we have positions that rally up and hit the initial profit target to come right back in, and we're only taking half of the profits, I get a lot of emails from clients like, well, Dave, why don't we just take the swing trade profits? It's like, oh, well, because you're never gonna capture a long-term trend if you do that. And then when we're blessed and we have a few longer-term trends or longer-term holdings in the portfolio doing really well, people are like, well, Dave, how come we just don't hold on to 100% of the position? It's like, well, if you do that, Longer term, you're going to end up with a lot of those statistics I talked about earlier. And through the hybrid approach of creating that free position or free rolling, as Charlie Kirk calls it after he saw how my methodology works, is is really the secret to trading, if there is a secret. At least it's, it's a secret that I found, that and your emotional management. Anyway, so in this particular case, what I did was, this was the initial profit target on the BKE or B key as I call it. And instead of taking profits when it was approaching that level, what I did was I said, you know what? I am going to put in a trailing stop. And so I was looking for like close to 60. And I said, well, what if I put in a trailing stop one point behind the market? Because this market is going straight up. So I put in my trailing stop as the market was going straight up, thinking that, okay, I'm gonna ride this another 10 points. Now, what I'm trying to accomplish here from a discretionary standpoint is like, instead of putting a limit order up around 60, where I was looking to take those partial profits about 10 points higher than I got in. And if I get it, bam, I get exactly that 10 points. It's like, well, now, what if I gave up a little bit of those 10 points, maybe one point or so, and just in case this thing goes to the moon, 
see how long I can ride out the trend intraday. And by the way, one thing that I do, and I learned this long time ago, I think from my futures broker 20 something years ago, is to make it a game as much as possible. So my game is how long can I hold on to half of these shares intraday? Well, I found out pretty quickly about seven minutes. <laughs> so, and I got knocked out of the position, but no big deal. It continued to drop and I'm like, okay, well, thank God I got out. And then of course, what happened? So I exited here or I got stopped, I should say, on a one point trailing stop. And then what happens? The market begins to take off. And it's, it has a few stutter steps along the way. So what I was trying to accomplish, and here's the ideally, would be that this thing rallies up for the rest of the day. And then let's say it closes way up here. So I can enter, I can you know, exit, mark it on close. And instead of making 10 points, I end up making like 12 points or more, or ideally much, much, much more. And not that you want to rush out and try to beat the system all the time, because I'm going to show you an example where I would recommend you not try to beat the system. But this is a case where a little bit of discretion can improve upon the system, not beat the system or outsmart the system, but improve upon the system by trailing that stop. So that's what I was trying to accomplish. And again, having this teaching business. I think is a quid pro quo type of situation because it forces me to work hard to try to make something like this work and creates these good examples. Like, okay, here's the game. I'm gonna ride this thing out and I'm gonna show you guys tomorrow, okay? What happened today? Unfortunately, in this case, it didn't work, but but you know, that's okay because I was willing to make that decision and live with it as I'm gonna explain in just a minute. In fact, I'm gonna say that right now. Trading like life all boils down to making decisions and living with them. It's, it's funny, trading is kind of a reflection of life and life is kind of a reflection on trading. And those two things kind of spill over. Your life spills over to your trading and your trading spills over into your life. I think we all know that. But trading all boils down to two decisions, making decisions and living with them. The living with them is a really hard part and the way you learn to live with them is you need to make better decisions in the first place. So are you picking the best of the best stocks? Or are you following your plan? And if you're doing all these things, living with them becomes a lot easier. And as I often preach, what you could do after the fact is go in and do a post-mortem on your trade and, and ask yourself, was this really the best of the best trade that I could find? Was this a signal that I had to take no questions asked. And if, if you could say yes to those things, then when you lose, I know, I, I, I dropped plenty of F-bombs. Where is my F-bomb? Oh, here it is. It's my F-bomb right here. <laughs> Mike P, are you here tonight? I'm showing your F-bomb. Mike P sent me an F-bomb. It's uh, quite sturdy. Anyway, it's making decisions and living with them. And uh, like Annie Duke talked about in Thinking in Bets, the secret to success in poker and life is separating the process from luck, separating skill from luck. And sometimes, as Terrence O'Deaton says, and I think Annie Duke referenced him, in fact, I know she referenced him in the book, and I'll put up a link, uh, davelearner.com slash books dash two dash read for books that I would highly recommend you read. And that was one of my favorites, Anyway, the whole book is basically about that bad poker players blame bad hands and, and a bad game on bad luck, whereas the good poker players focus more on following the process and let the chips fall where they may. She has a new book? Cool. All right. Well, uh, put it put it in chat, and I'll put the I'll put the link in here. I'll add it to the uh, the reading list. I'll if it's a uh, if it's worthy. I'm sure if it, I'm sure it is if it's coming from Lauren. Lauren is uh, checking in from down under. Good day, mate. You know, it's, went to Australia, hoping that somebody. I'm not hoping, but thinking that uh, everybody would say good day. You know, and uh, 
I don't think I got one good day while I was down there. And I also thought there'd be kangaroos hopping around everyone, everywhere. There was one dabbing on the side of the road. I didn't even see it. So it's a bit of a bummer. Anyway, I know I've digressed quite a bit. So again, making decisions and then living with them, separating luck from skill, following the process, all very, very important things. And then in more emotion management is also important. So I made a decision and ended up selling somewhere around here. And I was feeling pretty good about that decision because I was following the process. Yes, I tweaked it up a little bit with the intraday thing. And I wasn't trying to get cute. I was trying to squeeze out a few more points to A, put more money in my account. And then B, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, you know, this could also be a really cool lesson for the week in charts or the stock chart show. Anyway, so this is what happened coming today and it begins to implode and I'm instantly down four bucks on those remaining shares and that's a bit of a bummer. But, you know, I did one of those, well, what would Dave Lander do? Well, Dave Lander would do nothing because his stop is at break even. He, this is a free position and it's hard, it's hard sometimes to, um, to not drop that F-bomb, but I just have to live with that decision. It's usually I make a joke, joke of my wife's decision, wife's uh, expense on making decisions, but I better not in case she's watching. So the two questions you have to ask yourself on every trade is what's the well thought plan? Now I added that well thought in right before I went live because if you're not careful, you can come up with a bunch of plans. Like, oh, this looks great. I'm gonna get in this or whatever. But you really need to make sure that's a well thought plan. And one thing you could do, I know I preach a lot about post-mortems, and I just mentioned that a few minutes ago. But one thing I've been thinking about lately is a pre-mortem, okay, before you even enter the trade, like tonight when you're doing your analysis or you're looking at my Landry list or whatever you're looking at, just say, okay, if I take this trade, how will I feel in the future, okay? Now, this could be how will I manage the FOMO, the fear of missing out, okay? Is this the mother of all opportunities? MOA, I think is what I'm gonna try to make a little acronym for that. And do you feel like you have to take the trade? And could you live with yourself with a bad outcome? Because you're following prudent process. You're following a good process. So you just have to learn to live with yourself with the outcome. And if it's kind of a shoulder shrug and, and you're not feeling that F, yeah, then don't take the trade. But then realize that if it does take off without you, it wasn't an ideal setup to begin with. So that's one of the the secrets to trading. And, and as I don't know if I mentioned it earlier because I was, was talking to one of you guys. And the bottom line is it's really emotional management. My traders who have been with me the longest, and a lot of them are doing things that are a little bit different than mine, but they're taking some of my stuff and tweaking it. Some are scalpers, some are day traders, and they also do the position trading too. And the ones that I find are most successful, obviously two things, one, they've been at it the longest, and two, we talk just as much, just as much or more, probably much, much more about psychology as we do the methodology. As I often preach, when everybody comes into this business, we're all set up junkies. I'm still a set up junkie, okay? And I still do a little holy grail hunt here and there. I mean, you gotta have some fun, even though there is none and we know there's none. But I think as you mature as a trader and you get further down the line, you really start wrapping your head around that psychology. And believe me, it never goes away. I, I get up and I write three, what's her name? Um, it escapes me at the moment. I did not complete, I have her books here, two or three books of hers here. I haven't completed them yet. But I read the first few pages of one of them, The Artist's Way, and I can't think of her name off the top of my head. But anyway, she recommended writing three pages every morning and I wake up every day. Let's see if I can have it handy. It's it's so it's over there. But every day I write three, I've filled up probably a dozen notebooks doing this. And I used to do this many years ago. Don't know why I quit. But without digressing too far, I know, imagine that. I would strongly urge you do that. And that's why I haven't finished a book. I read that, said, oh, I'm gonna start those morning pages again. I never got around to finishing the book. But when I look at my morning pages, I'd say 
most of what I write is about psychology, my own psychology. And sometimes I beat myself up a little bit, like, why did you take that trade? It was kind of a mediocre trade. And and then I do come up with every now and then some some ideas about how to approach the market and the money management and things like that. But again, the majority of it boils down to psychology. Julia Cameron, thank you very much. For some reason, I couldn't think of that. So what's your well thought plan? And again, that's where the pre-mortem pre comes in, picking the best, leaving the rest. I know it sounds cliche, but after a while, you'll know if you're truly picking the best and leaving the rest. So the, the next thing is, are you following that plan? Now, let's talk about using discretion on gaps and fast moves on the open. And again, it comes down to having a plan, and then it also comes down to the emotional management, not getting too caught up and the excitement. You come in a day like today, if you're just getting whacked, it's kind of hard not to get sucked into all that. It's kind of hard to keep your head while everyone else is losing theirs. So let's talk about using discretion on gaps and fast moves on the open. So this was a trade that we had coming into today. And our trigger was down here around 100. And it gapped, I think it gapped just above the trigger and then sold off quickly on the open. And I meant to check that. It was either on or around the open, immediately triggered. And you could see that we had a big gap down. Well, futures are getting whacked overnight. So you know you're likely going to get killed or I'm sorry, you're likely to get a possible false entry and a possible opening gap reversal on the open. Now, here's the hard part. If it gaps lower below your entry and keeps on going, then you have to make a go or no-go decision, and that could be kind of tough. So anyway, this was a trigger. So I sat on my hands on the open, and there's a couple things that you can do. If it doesn't keep imploding, now an entry of 199, which would be a point lower, is not that big of a deal. So give it a little wiggle room on the open. And if it begins to rally, then you could take a second entry on the trade, okay? And then this way, you might avoid a losing trade should it just completely reverse. Now, one thing I would caution you not to do and believe me, when we go back to that, like if we'll just, let me rewind that. If we go back to what I was saying earlier about squeezing additional profits out, that's not trying to beat the system, that's trying to improve the system, okay? So by beat the system, what I'm saying is, okay, you're trying to get a better entry than a higher entry for a short. So let's say the market starts rallying up, so you decide, well, I'm going to sell short greater than 100. Well, the problem with that is what if this becomes a mother ball opening gap reversals? And by the end of the day, it's 105 or 110 or something like that. Well, you're going to be a hurt and pop because you could have missed this trade that turns into a big loser. So you don't want to try to beat the system. I get emails all the time. Hey, Dave, entry's at 100. It's at 105. I'm going to get in now because that's a five point better entry. It's like, no, that's not the idea. The idea is to enter in the direction of the trend. Now, the other thing that I see a lot of people do is try to mimic the original entry. So let's say that you got a gap lower and the stock begins to rally a little bit. It's like, okay, well, he said to get in at 100. So when it rallies up to 100, I'm going to go ahead and get in. Well, no, that's not the idea. The whole idea of the entry is to enter in the direction of the trend. And yeah, you're going to be paying a little bit worse price than the market because you're waiting for that market to kind of tip its hand. In this case, the market gap down and then begins to reverse. So we avoid the trade and then look to possibly get in should it re-trigger below that low, as I showed earlier. Now, one thing that you can do, and not to talk out of both sides of my mouth, but if you do want to be short a particular market, and you're a more active, aggressive type of trader, you can take an intraday setup. Now, here's the here's one problem with this. So you're creating more decisions for you, and the more decisions you make, the more emotions are attached. As I've preached before, 
every decision will have an emotion attached to it. And that's just neurology. And that doesn't matter whether you're down under like Lauren or John, I don't know where you are, but whether you're John over here in the States or wherever you are in the world, we all have the same neurology. Our psychology might be a little different, but one thing I'm finding, by the way, is that a lot of our psychology is the same. This one trait I've been working with uh, on uh, a, a very um, active basis, it's like we kind of have that same psychology. Uh, it, 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 the more traders I work with, the more I see we all sort of have those ups and downs and emotions because we all have a pulse and it's all, you know, we might be a little different in the way we do things, but we all pretty much have a shared psychology, whether we want to admit it or not. So the more decisions to make, the tougher it is, but for somebody a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more advanced, I'm not saying fade the market because I just preached for 10 minutes about trade in the direction of the trend and wait for the entry. But what you could do is he's like, I really want to be short this market. So maybe a range breakdown or an intraday breakdown or some sort of intraday setup, intraday pullback, such as Landry Light, like we have here. Okay, this is a little ACP plugin. And okay, we got a Landry Light pullback. This thing looks like it's getting ready to come unglued. So we see down here, we've had quite a few bars of Landry Light. We could actually look at the charts here. The trend is down. So we can go in and look to enter on an intraday trend. Okay, so that's that's okay. It takes a little bit more discretion and it's a little bit harder sometimes to live with your decisions as opposed to just missing that initial trade back here and saying well I'm going to put in a hard stop below here if it triggers fine if it doesn't I'm going to get on with my life now the other thing you could do would be slightly more aggressive but you could look to play possibly an intraday breakdown once you have this big old fat trading range established during the day I'd much rather play something like a pullback or something, some sort of intraday setup, some sort of fractal pattern as opposed to a breakdown, but I'm just kind of throwing out some additional ideas for you. So again, you might look to play that breakdown or something. Now, again, the more decisions you make, the more potential regret you're going to have. If you come in this morning and say, well, this is a fast move on the open, it's gapping through the entry, or it's make a fast move through the entry on the open, what if I Let's see if it is. What if I just let it establish this first bar? Now, here's the thing if it keeps dropping, then you have to make a go and no decision, which could be kind of tough. But let's say it worked out like today. And this is one reason I want to show the example because because within the first five minutes, it, it reversed. You put in a stop down here, then you go to the gym or go about your life or run your errands or do what you have to do and forget about it. You get alert on your phone, like, oh, okay, I got triggered in. Maybe I need to put a stop in. And check in a couple times to see what's going on. Maybe I'll put in a profit target or something vis-a-vis uh, -vis a limit order or something. Okay. Okay. The Annie Duke book is the bigger bluff. Oh, that's somebody else. Okay. You'll post it on Facebook. Cool. Okay. So Lauren's going to put the book on Facebook, and then I'll look it up tomorrow and. If you're watching this on September 7th, by the time you're watching this on YouTube, we'll have those links in here. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Laurent. So BCLI, another recent trade in here. You can see here are the parameters. 14.10 was the entry, 10.70 for a risk of 340. That was a protective stop at 10.70. Initial profit target, 340 above the entry. $17.50. By the way, if you're in the if you're a gold member, go to member resources and you could download a blank spreadsheet with all the formulas in it, obviously. A sample spreadsheet. You could put your numbers in this exact same exact spreadsheet. This is what I use. So here's the BCLI, nice, nice Landry Light. This is a 30-day EMA. Now, when I found this setup, keep in mind. I didn't scan for Landry Light. I just look at 2,000 charts a night or whatever the number is. It's a big number. I figured it out a while back. It was in the millions, like tens of millions of charts that I looked at over my lifetime. And, you know, usually when I speak, I'll say anybody in here, a musician and law of averages, somebody is. I'm like, well, how'd you get good? And they're like, well, I practice, you know, dumbass and plot. 
But I think if you want to get better at just looking at charts, when you do look at look at charts, look at a lot of charts, see what works and see what doesn't, and eventually you'll start to see some patterns emerge, such as the Landry light. And the cool thing about the Landry light pullbacks or kiss my goodbye, kiss MA being the moving average, as I called it in my third book, might be the last book for a while. I do have a book in my head though, and it's pretty cool. I've been working on it on and off. Truth be told. Anyway, long story endless, you can see it pulls back to the moving average. It does have one little downside bar of Landry Light, but this trend has been so strong. This stock rallied about 300%. So it's like, you know, I'm not going to get too excited about one little bar below the moving average. In fact, I actually like a deep, a nice deep pullback, at least in this particular market, with all these little go-go stocks. So the entry's up here, the stop is down here. And the initial profit target is up here. So let's see what happens. Oh, it triggers an entry, and then it starts coming back in. And it comes dangerously close to the stop, but it doesn't quite hit it. But net net, we're in this trade, what, a month? Or at least three or four weeks, three weeks. I guess four weeks would be a month. You begin to wonder, is this dead money? Well, as I preach, if you do, a position was dead money. If you do, it had little or no chance of appreciation. Then, of course, get out uh, the stock. But the thing is, you don't know if it's dead money. It might just be consolidating from this big old fat trend that it had back here. And as long as it doesn't stop you out, stay with it. And as you can see, it hasn't set the world on fire just yet. But so far, so good. We're now back in black. And here comes that word. But hopefully... We'll rally up to initial profit target and sticking with it vis-a-vis -a, -vis a stop. In other words, just following the plan. And that's the hardest, easiest thing you'll ever do, is especially with like with a dead money stock. You come in every day and you're looking at that negative account balance every day, every day, every day, every day. It begins to wear on you. And it's kind of interesting. Somebody a while back had exited a position. And he goes, I know I, I exited even though the stop wasn't hit, because one day I accidentally exited it i sold all thousand shares or whatever he had and i was like wait a minute i wasn't supposed to sell that stock a fat thing or that so he immediately bought it back well when he bought it back he got a new cost basis in his portfolio and it really bothered him to look at that negative number every day even though if you look at the whole trade in the bigger picture sands the few cents that he was off during the transaction the 10 cents or 50 cents or whatever it was that he was out of the market, he might even got an improvement on the trade. You know, he might have sold by accident and then gotten back in at a little bit lower level, but he just didn't like looking at the negative number. And, and I, I get it because a lot of times, in fact, all day long, I'm looking at my equity and my accounts and I'm looking at the positions like, okay, who's on the chopping block? Which, which employee is getting fired? Okay, treat your stocks like employees, not like your little pets. Or your children, okay? Anyway, so so far this is working. Now LAC was another one, very similar kind of action, although this one so far, knock on wood, has paid off. Entry 740, protective stop, where 560, initial profit target 920, so that's 180. And again, I'll give you the spreadsheet with all these formulas in it. So let's take a look at it. Nice, nice uptrend. I think it was David Keller. David Keller has been around so many different people. He was lead technical analysis for Fidelity. I don't know if you heard of that company or not. Some little financial company. Before he joined stock charts. And so he knows everybody in the world. And he's got so many good little quotes from all those different people. But one of the guys he's worked with, I think one of his mentors, said he likes trends that he doesn't need his eyeglasses to see. So if I unclick here, you know what? I can see that. I can see that big big blue arrow from across the room. So that's a good looking, click back in. That's a good looking trend. So you like to trade stocks that have trends that you don't need your eyeglasses to see. And in case you don't see that, the little, as I call them, illustrator, not indicator in the bottom of the chart shows you that this stock is in a pretty darn good trend. In fact, you know, I'm just seeing this for the first time here. Look at the Landry light back here. Look at that, look at that Landry light, it's huge. So this was a Landry light setup back here. Well, it's no big shocker because everything works better with trend. I think that was last week's lesson and a lesson that we often do. 
So it pulls back to the moving average. The Landry Life just counts the number of days, again, that the lows are greater than the moving average, okay? If the low intersects the moving average, it goes to zero, okay? If the high goes below the moving average, it goes to negative one, okay? Green on top, red on the bottom. So our entry is right there. Our stop is down here. Our initial profit target is up here. And let's take a look at what happened. So not a whole lot, but if we stick with it, you can see that it does trigger after several days. But unfortunately, it begins to fail, I wouldn't say miserably, but we're underwater a week or so into the trade. And you're probably thinking, well, this thing has lost momentum. I better get out. Well, just sit tight. Settle down, Beavis. Let's just see what happens. Is it dead money? Well, no. Now, they don't always come back. I mean, if they did, you'd never see my fat ass again. <laughs> but longer term, the thing to do is what? Follow your plan, okay? You get stopped out, so be it. Here's the other thing too, the methodology depends on the occasional outlier to make big money, okay? And without those few outliers, you're gonna do mediocre at best. And if you micromanage yourself out of trades, getting bored in a trade and saying, well, I'm just gonna use a time stop to get me out if I'm not profitable in a week or a month even. You go back and look at, uh, was it AU? I think took three months to get paid. So what? If you look at that on an annualized basis, that's that's still a pretty good deal annualized it's it's huge i mean tiny l's is coming out again it's huge annualized if you did that well even though it took you three months to get paid you you'd own the world if every trade at worst it took you three months to get paid so anyway the reason i want to show you this one in addition to kind of going through the open portfolio to show you where we are is that it was a near miss on a profit target so the profit target was at nine dollars and twenty cents, and it rallied up to nine dollars and nineteen cents. Okay, so it missed by one penny. Now, just to FYI, on this particular one, when it got really close to that profit target, instead of taking partial profits personally, I put in a trailing stop. So I got a little bit worse. I did a little bit worse. I, was, I think it was a quarter point, twenty-five cents trailing stop. I did a little bit worse than if I would've just exited up around that one cent away from the profit target. So don't split hairs when it gets this close, go ahead and take profits is the lesson there. Now, you have to live that decision. The next day that I come in and the stock begins to rally. I'm like, oh man, I wish I'd have hung on. And I was like, wait a minute, Dave, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You decided to do what you thought would be the best thing to do you weren't you 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 weren't you you weren't outside the methodology in fact you were trying to improve upon things a little bit okay and it just didn't work out and then it comes back in a little bit by the end of the day i'm thinking okay well maybe maybe that's a good thing that i did get out right and then today after a bit of a dip i'm like yep glad i took profits then it turns around and bangs out brand new highs i think like i said a few days ago maybe tesla will buy them out doesn't doesn't a electric car need some lithium i mean i might need some lithium after today <laughs> i don't even know what lithium does it chills you out i think it's a i think it's a song Kurt Cobain. all right let's take a look at apg also in the open portfolio this particular case, a little bit less volatile. Well, I wouldn't say less volatile, but two point stop on a $12 stock, that's almost 20%, that's pretty volatile. And this was the first deep retracement. Now, if you go back in and watch the IPO course from 2014, I showed this pattern and I showed quite a few that worked and I said I wasn't fully committed to trading it, but I am now and I do trade these first deep retracements. The reason I'm saying that is, Usually with this many bars and the pullback, I'll pass on a trade. But in an IPO, I'm a little bit more lenient. So this thing came public, had a decent run, about 50% higher, and then it pulls back very deeply, as you can see. So here's our entry, here's our stop, here's the initial 
profit target. Boy, doesn't this look easy? <laughs> it looks fan. It looks like you know when I'm doing these presentations, I'm like boy, it, it it's it's really easy. And then when you know once that market bell opens, ding ding ding, it's like it all it all gets a lot tougher. But all you have to do is just follow the plan. So my wife went back when we lived in a house that required a little bit more maintenance than one. We we're in a brand new house, so thank God. But the other house required a lot more maintenance, and she's always like, "All you got to do is just kind of with your wrench." And it's like, "Yeah, well, that usually didn't work." Anyway, you can see he tried to get that initial profit ta profit target. He tried to say it came back in, but then rallied right back up again. Another case of not micromanaging. And after it banged out initial profit target, we bring our stop up to break even. In fact, in reality, we actually bump it a little bit as long as it's making closing. I should say at new closing highs, okay? But in, in more recent years, just FYI, and I've been applying a, if you go back and look at, and I think it was Mike Peterson pointed out, in fact, I know it was Mike Peterson pointed out, when he did his due diligence to see who I was, when I was gonna be the guest of honor at Charlie Kirk's president, uh, retreat down in St. Lucia, that was, oh my God, is that almost two years ago? Wow, time goes fast. He's like, well, let me check this guy out. And he went back and found me talking in the forum 20 years ago about bow ties. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, back then we called it uh, Daylight instead of uh, Landry Light. It was Daylight, Dave Light, and now it's morphed into Landry Light. My wife said, why don't you be like Bollinger and put your name on something? So, all right, okay, I'm, I'm trying, babe. So anyway, we could see that we're up to break even and not a whole lot has happened since, okay? And we're still above the entry, but not by much. It's nothing to write home about. But here comes that word. Hopefully, six months from now, I'm going to say, remember that APG that was kind of becoming dead money? And we took our initial profit targets out, and we've got our stop at break even. Well, this thing is now at $100 a share. Let's hope. Rackspace was one recently. The reason I want to show you this one is we actually went back to the well on this one. And so far, it has not worked on the second trade. But the first trade was 1860, 16, 2120, and $2.60 FDR, first deep retracement. Well, it really wasn't that deep a retracement, but you can see it did retrace a little bit. Uh, percentage wise, a pretty big re retracement. So you can see entry was here, stop was down here. I love IPOs, initial profit dog up here, one of my favorite markets to trade. And you can see that it didn't do a whole lot at first, but then I don't know why, but it came, we came in and gapped higher, bangs that initial profit target out. And then we get that stop up to break even and we're gonna ride this forever, right? At least that's what I thought. And then the next day it comes back in, stops us out, and kind of meanders, and then pulls back for a while and very deeply. Now, a little hard sometimes to go back to the well, especially after a profitable trade. But as you can see, it's right here in the portfolio, and that's exactly what we did. We went right back in. Entry was 2025. 20, and our risk and our goal for the first half of the trade is three dollars and thirty cents, okay? Which gives us a profit target right here, as you can see, twenty-three fifty-five and a stop at sixteen ninety-five. So let's take a look at that. Entry was there, and stop was down here. And so far, I wouldn't say it failed miserably, but any any position that's underwater, as far as I'm concerned, is failing miserably. But until and unless we get stopped out, again, another lesson in following the plan, we're going to stick with it. So, so far, not really so good there. This is something that I touched upon last week, and I think tonight there's quite a few more examples, and I'm pretty sure that given the bunch that's here tonight, you guys will ask about a lot of stocks that are either deep pullbacks or first thrust? Well, the, the answer is you don't know for sure, but sometimes you've got like an obvious pullback, something like a generic pullback, a TKO, a trend pivot pullback. And sometimes you have an obvious transition. A stock implodes, begins to rally up a little bit, and then you're looking to play that first thrust down. And sometimes they make it easy on us, and this is what we're seeing now, now that we have a week. See, last week things were beginning to come unglued a little bit, 
And then this week, a little bit more. We're certainly not banging on new highs in the market. So that's given the bow ties time to catch up the price. And in some cases, price has, has worsened. So it's a no brainer if a market bow ties down of all time highs, if a stock bow ties down of all time highs, then it's a short, okay? The tricky part is when it pulls back deeply and it can go either way. And one of my clients pointed out, very, uh, was very astute of him. He said, hey, you know what, Dave? I noticed that some of the longs on your Landry list from two weeks ago or a week ago are now shorts. And it's like, ah, you're paying attention. So that's the point is where you get to an inflection point. So sometimes you get a deep pullback and it turns into what I call a micro first thrust or a pioneer first thrust where it's not this huge drop lower, but it's a significant move to where if it stalls out a little bit and it's retraced back up to, toward old highs, then you could have the mother of all tops. Now, on the short side, it does pay to anticipate a little bit, but the short side is also tricky. So a little bit more dangerous trade. Okay, before we get into live charts, I am sending out about, or actually my wife did it for me, um, She's sending out quite a few emails to people who are gold members or trading. If you're a trading service member right now, gold is free and it has been for a while. And it'll probably stay that way. But if you're a member of the trading service or just a gold member, either way, you you have the right to join the Facebook group. So I would recommend you join it. Trading could be a really lonely sport, and it's kind of nice to be able to share our trials and tribulations with each other. And I get a lot of good ideas out of that. That um, that B key, I could have missed that if it wasn't for for John uh, mentioning it. And uh, some of you other guys have, have really thrown out some really good trades, and I appreciate that. And you can ask for help. And like I say each week, a lot of times I'll I'll say, oh, I got to answer that question. And by the time I get around to answering it, two or three of you guys chime in. You can also see the signs and signals. Uh, we have some people in here doing a little hourly work. I think Jim Freeman's doing a lot of hourly work with the market timing, and that's kind of cool to watch him do that stuff. And occasionally I'll throw out like opening gap reversals. And I'll also mention for those on the service, I'll also mention like a little discretion. Like this morning, I say, hey guys, CDNS is going to trigger on the open. Let's be careful not to get sucked in just in case it's an opening gap reversal. And in this particular case, it ended up being that. All right, let me shift gears and get my charts, and I'll answer the questions that are uh, or the comments. And then we'll, um, if you want to start asking about anything in general or any stocks, let's take a look at the overall market real quick. And then we'll get to the individual questions. Okay. So I got to wake up. So next time I go to Australia, hopefully there's the next time. It, seems, it sounds like you guys are some fans down there, and I appreciate that. Maybe you guys can put together a little. Uh, a little something i'll come down and talk to you guys be happy to. i'd love to do that i'd love to go i love the return you know i didn't realize how big it was <laughs> i thought it'd be like oh i'm gonna go to a great barrier reef then i'm gonna go see those uh apostle rocks or whatever it is and i'm gonna do this and do that and it's a big place it, it could be a continent it really could so i need to wake up early if i want to see the kangaroos all right that's good to know the bigger bluff from from maria 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 Konakov. Okay, cool, Lauren. Yeah, post it on Facebook. It's a really good read. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely put them on my list. I'm always looking for books, and you know, I've probably got you can't see them because of my banner, but I've got hundreds here, and I was looking for books. I think it was yesterday morning, <laughs> and um, I had a few of them in my cart, and I'm like, you know, I think I have that one already. So I gotta watch myself. It's a bit of a sickness. All right, let's take a look at the overall market. And I think we're at an inflection point and a little concerned. As I often preach, indicators don't ind indicate, they illustrate, and they lag, obviously. But lag is okay sometimes. And we talked about this, I think, in last week at Charts. Sometimes the lag can keep you from getting whipsawed and keep you possibly in a longer term trend. So lag isn't always a bad thing. I, I know that years ago there was a, somebody developed, a, I'm, I'm showing sure my age, but I think it was in 1992 or 93 or 94, 
somebody used to advertise religiously in stocks commodities we have a moving average that has no lag it's like oh no you don't danny <laughs> so anyway it's going to have some lag and, and moving average just kind of show you what's already in the chart so if we took this moving average out and we didn't know anything we say well where's the market uh back in august it was about 35 60 where is it now oh it's at 35 47. yeah it went a little higher in the meantime but it's dropped since where was the market a few weeks ago well it was at um 35 3600 whereas it now it's at 3350 so it's down six percent so it doesn't mean it's the end of the world but it's it is beginning to roll over a little bit and when you throw those moving averages in there you could say, okay, wait a minute, this 10-day moving average is now diving hard, okay? And it's crossed below the 30 and the 20, the 20 and the 30 respectively. And the exponential moving averages, as I say quite often lately, as I learned from Greg Morris, as soon as the price crosses below them, they'll turn down, okay? So notice here the 30, I'm sorry, the 20 turned down and the 30 was still headed up, okay? Close above the 30, moving average stays pointing up. Exponential moving average stays pointing up. Close below the moving average, exponential moving average turns down. Notice here that the simple was still headed higher. Now, remember I said that lag thing earlier is not always a bad thing, and by accident I discovered the 10-day simple interaction with the 20-day exponential and the 30-day exponential. And that's how I came up with the bow tie pattern. So when you have a crossing after all time highs, you better pay attention. No guarantee that it's gonna be the mother of all tops. Okay, this one right here didn't turn at the mother of all tops, although the market consolidated for a while. And this one wasn't quite off all time highs, but it was worth paying attention to. But this one here turned into the mother of all signals, as you can see, pretty serious drop. So if we bow tie down i would become concerned i wouldn't go i wouldn't get crazy bearish but as you know lately i've been showing a short or two in the service i did end up short cdns today so i am short one stock now and the rest belongs in the portfolio as far as i'm concerned i would be okay getting stopped out of that if the market just went straight back up and i made a fortune on all those other positions okay i don't want to rush out and short but you if you can't be in the train you love love the train you're in database is producing a plethora of shorts so now's the time to do some shorting now here's the good news possible good news it might just be a bit of a sector rotation so we might end up short a few sectors and then long some newer sectors okay maybe some more stodgy boring sectors but that's okay and then we can make money on both trades. Now, I don't want to try to play both fins against the middle. Every now and then I'll try to do something like that and be cute, and I'll get my R's handed to me. But it's possible that we could see some setups in some of these more stodgy areas, and we could get knocked out and possibly even short in some of these more go-go areas like semiconductors. Before I digress too far, let's just close the loop on the P. So use, let's just say 3,300 round numbers as a reference point here. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ had an opening gap reversal today off its best levels, but in, in this, the slow right here held. So that's important, okay? So as long as the recent lows hold, let's not go crazy bearish. Yeah, fire up a shorter tube if you have a decent looking setup. By the way, the problem with short side, I was talking with, in fact, I think it was you, Lawrence, this morning, and you were looking at two or three other shorts. And the problem with short side is, if you don't dogpile into all those shorts, the market begins to drop and you you end up with just one or two shorts and you're like, oh great, I got one or two shorts on and the, the market's imploding. And boy, I wish I had a lot more shorts on. If you do pile into a lot of shorts, then what looked like a rollover turns into just a correction and the market goes straight back up. So it's tricky. By the way, let's take a look at weekly in the NASDAQ. Weekly still looks pretty good in the NASDAQ. Weekly in the S&P 500 still looks pretty good too, okay? Let's take a look at the Rusty. The Rusty, as you can see, it's kind of stuck in a range, okay? I don't need my eyeglasses to see that. 
And you can see that the 10-day, the notice the 10-day simple is diving even though prices are above it, okay? And that's the interaction we talked about earlier is like there's a lot of lag even in this 10-day, but once it begins to catch up, it usually catches up pretty quickly, okay? So you can see that we're below, obviously, yesterday's low, a little bit of an opening gap reversal there. I would like to see all these indices get above their moving averages, not that the moving averages are a line in the sand. But as long as we stay above them, I think the market is okay. Okay. Um, gold's been kind of sideways as of late. Longer term, long still longer term trend. It's kind of hugging around its 30-day EMA. The 30-day EMA, as you may know, has been one of my favorite indicators as of late, especially combined with Landry Lights, Landry Light and pullback to that 30 EMA. Metals and mining. Right off of all-time highs, one of the better looking areas out there trying to break out, as you can see. So that's looking pretty interested, interesting in here. So maybe we'll see some setups there soon. Gold and silver are kind of consolidating in here. Longer term, still in uptrends. I think I may have one leftover gold stock in my portfolio, ASM, if memory serves, I think. Manufacturing, look at this, up near brand new highs. Notice how that 30 held, okay? So far, you had Landry Light the whole way up, proper order whole way up. Let's take a look at MNC, materials and construction, just off of brand new highs in here. So that's looking pretty good. Now, we take a look at some of the stronger areas like retail. And as we could see, as you could see, we could get a bow tie down really soon, unless, of course, we just bounce right back up. And that would be fine with me. But I would say this would be more of a caution. And what's kind of cool about the ACP indicator, if you're looking at something like bow ties, and I'll pull it up in just one second, it'll turn yellow as soon as you begin to cross with the bow ties. Well, you can see that in the chart. And if you didn't have that in the chart, you could say, well, wait a minute, this area has lost a little bit of steam. Where was it back in August? A month and a week ago, it was around uh, 4,100. Where is it now? It's at 4,070. So it's lost a little steam down about three quarters of a percent over that period of time. Semiconductors, another one of those areas lost a little steam. I know, we, although we had an opening gap reversal today. And what's kind of cool is, and you know, I'm seeing this live just like you, and it's making me realize the importance of paying paying attention when when necessary to these moving averages. When this thing's just going straight up or just grinding its way higher in a nice persistent trend like it was back here. There's no need to plot any moving averages or anything, but when things begin to slow down a little bit or begins to pull back kind of deeply, it starts looking more than a, than a pullback, that's a good time to throw in your moving averages, okay? So you can see just a couple of days ago when the price is above the moving averages, the 10, again, is going to be a little slow to turn, but for the most part, they're coming together and looking like they want to turn back up. Well, what a difference a day or two makes. Once you get down below them, again, they roll back over. So it'll be interesting to, to watch. Okay. So if you guys want to talk about individual issues, let me just, let's just take a look at a couple of these things real quick in ACP. And then, um, oh, by the way, you can get people to say, and where can I get Landry Light? You can get it in ACP if you're a um, subscriber to stockcharts.com. It's also, it originated, Landry Light, the, the, at least the indicator, originated in um, Metastock a, a few years back. They programmed that in for me. And then now we have it in ACP. So take a look at spiders, for instance. You could see you know, going back here, we had we had some nice green pull back to the moving average, nice green pull back to the moving average. And we talked about that last week, this little pullback back here. And then now we're having another pullback, which is actually somewhat bullish, okay? But I'm a little bit concerned based on the action in the bow ties. So if we put the bow ties in, and then I need to see. I don't like these colors. I have to see the change of colors. But just just quickly for educational purposes, take a look at this. Let's take a look at the. I wish they put the plugins higher up. So if you do, by the way, if you do have a subscription to stockcharts.com, then click on this little plugin down here and you'll get the plugin for free. Only 
if you're watching on YouTube and you like this video, okay? You have to like the video. So proper order in the moving averages, you can see that we had proper order for a long, 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 long time. And this is kind of a fun little indicator. I know I'm a nerd. You probably want to party with me, but I just love this and messing around with this. And you can see, well, I can see it in the charts. It's going higher. But now you got a bit of a caution because we dip below the 30, which is blue right here. And you can see that you have zero and then you have minus one. Okay. And then now we have minus one again. So when it starts chopping around that moving average, go in and watch last week's presentations where we talked about presentation. We talked about the, and it might also be in the homepage of the stock chart show. Tomorrow, I'm going to put the stock chart show on the homepage. If you're watching on Friday, it should be there. And if you're looking for more of these shows, by the way, if you are if you sign up to at least be a free member behind the firewall, I have a lot of these shows that I put th there for the free members. And then obviously, if you have gold, you have access to, to uh, all of these shows that I've done. But anyway, you can see it's green, red, green, red, green, red. So beginning to get a little cautious in here. Certainly not the end of the world, but you definitely want to pay attention. So now I'm going to jump back. You guys keep asking about individual stocks. Lauren wants to know about TTD. Yeah, that's going to be that's going to be an interesting one. Let's see. All right, let's do this. And that might be a good yeah, that's going to be a good example of a bow tie probably. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that, okay, this thing made kind of a double top in here, and I can't draw it easily, but it's kind of an inverted cup and handle, okay? And then, obviously, we had the gap down today. So this stock looks like a stock that's in trouble. Ideally, I like to see a little bit of a pullback, but when the stock is in a transitional setup, meaning that it's in a possible emerging trend, in a case like this, could be rolling over, you can't sit around and wait for a deep pullback. Now, lo and behold, this is a bow tie, and it would have triggered today, okay? Um, ideally, I'd like to see it rally a little bit again, but, excuse me, I think that an entry below this low here could be a possible trade, but you might want to see if it could rally up a little bit and then look to short it when it rolls back over. So, yeah, good uh, job on that one. All right, any more? I think we probably talked about all the stocks we were going to talk about in the group. Y'all gonna make it easy on me tonight. Let me see if I could find something. So getting asked about the, the, the deep pullback versus the transitional pattern. If a market loses steam like this, okay? So we've got two, well, one and a half month, so six weeks of this market not making any new progress, at least on a net net basis, okay? And then coming back up here, and it's also, let's see if I could do this on the fly. The pin had been working well lately. I don't know what's going on with GoToWebinar, but let's give it a shot and see. It just kind of jumps around, but you can see that it's kind of rolled over. Yep. Uh, it has a mind of its own. <laughs> Use your mind's eye, bring this cup and handle, inverted cup and handle over there. So it does have uh, an inverted cup and handle look to it. It's also a bow tie to the downside, okay? Oh, well, I don't know. Let me just check. So let's put the bow tie in here. And yeah, close enough. It's pretty much a bow tie, as you can see. So this looks like a stock that has topped out. So this is the kind of toppy action I'm seeing in a lot of the tech that's out there. Now, hopefully, I know I just said hope, but hopefully it'll keep heading higher. Meg, I am actually long Meg and thinking about that I might have to exit if it drops much further. But let me just tell you this, I would mortgage my house. I would, you know, your kids are, your kids are pain in the ass anyway, right? If your kids are like mine, just take their college funds and then put it all into this stock. Okay. Mortgage your house, um, hockey wife's jewelry, you know, just get as much money as you can and dog pile into the stock. This is the best looking stock I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> okay, I'm joking. Please, no one take me out of context. I'm getting a lot of trouble. Yeah, I like this one a lot. I played this one initially on a breakout. I did take partial profits already on this one. And, and I'm probably overstaying my welcome a little bit. Okay. 
but it's a good looking stock. The only problem is it turned out to be a little bit on the thin side, okay? And we don't want to end up with, I think that's your term, John, Hotel California type of stock. But yeah, I like it. Maybe about 28 for an entry and maybe about 24 or possibly a little bit lower for a stop. Let's just say four points. Make the math easy tonight. Enter at 28, initial profit target 32. Do wait for an entry. And I hope, I hate to use the word hope, but I hope it triggers and we're long together. FTNT as a short. FTNT as a short. So you got stopped out on that one, John? Yeah, okay. I you know, I was looking at I was almost gonna exit today and I'm like, well, you know what? We had a pretty ugly spill in the overall market. Let's just see if we could hang on a little bit longer. I mean, shame on me, I should have had the exact plan in place, but uh it kind of got away from me. Uh but yeah, I did take partial profits. So technically, as long as I don't go negative on that position, because it didn't really go that far past my initial profit target, it's okay. Uh, FTNT, yeah, that looks like a, a possible short. Looks like it's got okay volume. Kind of cracked today. I do like these stocks that are at higher levels rolling over. This one's in a lot of trouble. It might have a little support down here. You might be able to find something a little bit cleaner, okay, than this. But yeah, it looks like looks like it's in trouble, but a little support here. I prefer something like uh, the Logi or something like that, or the way like the way CDNS looks. CDNS, you see how CDNS is way up here, and then just a few weeks ago, or a week or two ago, everybody in the world was very, very, very happy. Okay, nothing magical about what I do. Nothing magical about technical analysis. We're simply reading the emotions of the market while at the same time trying to embrace our own. So everybody in the brother is happy here, begins to implode. The Johnny come lately, if they haven't bailed out yet, are likely to bail out really soon because they don't have staying power and they don't have emotional, emotional fortitude. But if this thing begins to crack, then let's say it cracks down the 90. Well, anybody that owned it or bought it at 90 is gonna be hurting, okay? So if it goes to 80, they're gonna have to make a hard decision. Do I need to get out? And then you can see how this can kind of the snowball sort of can roll down the hill and not warm more people out. Okay, Lawrence says, got it. Thanks, makes sense when comparing to CDNS. Yeah. Oh, John Zitensky. Yeah, so many times I I give, you know, John Ross, I give you a lot of credit because a lot of times it's you that, that you know, give me, giving us these stocks and things, okay? All right, Dakota, good to see you, Dakota. AMATS already dropped too far, too short. AMATS. Dakota, are you in San Francisco? I forget. Um, I think there's some other ones out there in the semis. I think this is still in a lot of trouble, Dakota, and I think you're right. Um, I think there's some other ones in the semis, but I guess if you were looking at big, 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 huge Oakland, okay, gotcha, big picture, then um, this looks like the mother of all tops. So I don't think it's too late to short. I think it could be in the early phases of rolling over. I kind of like that something similar to the CDNS, but in semis, that's kind of like just beginning to crack because if this thing cracks, it's going to implode 20, 30 points overnight or not overnight, but oh, hopefully overnight. Now I'm short. My apologies to anyone who is long. Yeah, that meg looks pretty good now. I have to agree. And that's what was killing me today, John. It's like I'm looking at it going like, I got to get out. I got to get out. It's like, if I get out, I've gotten knocked out of this pullback. It looks so darn good. I mean, sometimes you get the stock and it just implodes you like, you know, say you were long back here on this particular stock, whatever. Oh, CDNS still. And it starts imploding. It's down here. And it's bow tied down. And I was like, you know, I'm a stupid idiot. I need to be out. But it's much harder when you're in a stock that's set up to go long again, to take off again. Out of Meg yesterday, so a lot of you got knocked out of Meg. Okay, yeah, I'm I'm probably hanging on a little too little too long. All right, Griff says, what do you think about EXPI? I think EXPI. It's a reach as a long or a short. I guess a long, huh? A few days ago, it looked a lot better than it does now. Let's clean this chart up and go back a few days. So this is kind of a double top knockout move. I'd actually like to see more of a knockout. So that's kind of bullish and looking pretty good. 
you've got a nice accelerated trend. Now it's a little frothy, but that's a really good looking accelerated trend, trend knockout. So we walk forward a little bit, you know, maybe if it pulls back, it's had so much momentum, maybe the next pull, maybe if it gets back to 35 again, we'll take another look at it. But for now, I would just, I'd put that on my momentum list for now, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't take it right away. A lot of you guys played that uh, played that Meg. Did we talk about that? We talked. Uh, God, I hope we talked about that in the Facebook group because that would be another good example. And by the way, what you could do, I think you guys probably know this, but if you if you go to the group and you hit search and put in a stock ticker, you can see the days we talked about it. And I've been doing that a lot, and that's been a lot of fun. I know you want to party with me, right? <laughs> but it's been really kind of cool to see to see who brought it up and when. You know, it's it's just been. I love the group. I really do. Yeah, I think it has potential grip, but I would I would just uh, wait for now on that. XBI, it's probably going to be an ETF. Yeah, there's your biotech ETF. Now, biotech, I'm kind of a longer term biotech bull. And I got a little concern when these biotech ETFs and biotech itself. Let's see if we can find biotech. This is a little bit cleaner trading, but you can't trade it, okay? So if you follow along in the service, which you can go to daylander.com slash archives, and I'll update them probably up until maybe a few days ago, just not to give too much away. But you can go in and see my thinking at the time. You can go back and look at it 20 years. There's a gap in there, I know. And God knows where those those files on hard drives, probably in a garage somewhere. And I just got to figure that out someday. I need to dig through them and find them. But the point I was trying to make or trying to get to is that you can go in and look at those archives and see my thinking at the time, good, bad, and indifferent, kind of warts and all type of situation. So biotech was rolling over. I was concerned about that, although I did or was continuing to see some individual issues I still liked during this time, okay? And then biotech came roaring back in here, okay? Now, not that there's anything magical about this, but if you're above these moving averages and they're in uptrend proper water, which by the way, they're not now, but as long as you're above these moving averages, they, they will be soon, then things are generally okay, all right? So getting back to your stock, uh, I wouldn't buy this. For me to get a new setup here, Carol, it's gonna have to go up to brand new highs. So it's gonna have to get above 120. And then I'll know it when I see it once it, it does that, okay? Oh, it's your company stock, so you're long a lot. Wow, you're doing great. Maybe I could borrow some money. <laughs> awesome. What's the, what's the ticker on that? Uh, I forget which one we were looking at. Oh, it was that one. EXPI. Wow, you're doing great. I hope you uh, negotiated a huge options package. Where are you located? I'm gonna come hang out with you. <laughs> Drinks on you. Fantastic. Well, good for you. Yeah, it looks great so far. I mean, you know, here's the deal. If you're long, what's those funny lines in there? Those little lines are funny looking. Let's take a look at that. You know, let's have some fun here. I know you want to party with me. Let's go here. And let's take a look at that over here. So we have down below, I mean, you could definitely see that it's lost steam, but look at how much green you have. And look, the, the bow ties have been pro in proper order all the way since, I don't know if you can see it on your screen, since like the 21st of June. But you can also see they are beginning to roll over a little bit. And you can also see on a net net basis, it's losing a little steam, okay? I don't know if this is a log chart or not. I'll have to check on that. I like using arithmetic charts, but if this is a log chart, it's gonna look a little bit more toppy on a log chart, okay? San Antonio, that's not too far away. We might drive over and see you. <laughs> I might get a Bronco uh, when they come out. So maybe uh, maybe we'll go four wheeling over there. I'll buy you a beer if, if I go over there. You don't have to buy a beer. Someday you should wear one of your fancy boy shirts. <laughs> yeah, I do have some fancy boy shirts. You know, by 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 accident, I happen to have I got Gary in here. Uh, <laughs> Y'all know Gary from um, 
from Facebook fame. <laughs> I was looking for a black shirt tonight. I was like, I could turn Gary around. That might be uh, kind of snug. Yeah, I do have some fancy shirts. <laughs> I'm a bit of a fancy lad when it comes to my shirts. You got the beer? Fantastic. All right, Griff, I might take you up on that. <laughs> I could hear my wife. Now, who is this guy again? And how do you know him? I met him on the internet, babe. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> All right, let's go over to. I might have to go visit Dakota too. His business is, uh, I know what his business is, a little bit more interesting than some of our business, They're a lot more interested in trading for sure. Uh, let's share the screen telechart. Yeah, keep them coming. We've got time for a few more for sure. All right, Spock. That's one of those crazy companies. I used to toss these out of my IPO list, and now, man, when I see them, I get all excited. Um, I think I'm still on Fisker by the skin of my teeth. I don't know how it didn't get knocked out here. I think I was, I think there was something crazy going on in the market by the time I got my orders in or dirty reverse. Thank the thank the Lord, thank the Lord. Now keep in mind, I get knocked out of a lot of things, so I just got lucky on that one. Um, I think that's an is Fisker another one of those crazy companies? Yeah, this one looks okay. I mean, it's not a perfect setup as far as my methodology is concerned. It's that return to paradise uh, pattern that you guys talked about in the Facebook group, okay? <laughs> Great way to lose money in my business. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to come visit sometime. Let everything settle down. California's kind of a little crazy right now. I guess that's part of the allure of California, right? Um, yeah, maybe a little bit more pullback. Who asked about this? One of the Johns? I don't know. But yeah, these crazy things. Look at the HV. HV is huge. Look at that 107 HV. Great way to lose money in my business. <laughs> okay. Uh, any more? We got time for maybe one more. Got a couple of minutes left. While we're in impasse, I obviously want to thank everybody for coming. I had a blast tonight. I know I'm such a nerd. <laughs> I love doing these shows. I want to thank you guys and girls for being here tonight. The ladies have been represented well lately, so good to see you here tonight. If we don't talk to you now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. So, again, thanks, everybody, for showing up. I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much.